We are live. We are live. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 199 and the Retina Session 51. And today we have with us Dr. Guru Prasad S. Arachit from M.M. Joshi Institute, Hubli. And he'll be talking on lasers and retinal disease and overview. And it's quite an important topic. And thank you, sir, for uh, agreeing to uh, cover such an important topic. He is one of the first VR surgeons of North Karnataka and the head of VR services in M.M. Jo Joshi Institute with 36 years of experience. And he has been a DNB experienced teacher since 1997 and a program director of the VR fellowship in RJHS. He's a past president of KOS and former member ethics committee of AIOS and member medical legal cell of AIOS. He has special interest in retina, uvia, and combined surgeries, of course, and he's performed more than 18,000 VR surgeries with various presentations at state, national, and international levels and publications. He's an invited faculty for most of the conferences everywhere, and he is one of the most loved and down-to-earth faculties that I have ever known. And he has several honorable awards to his name, and he's a Rotary International Outstanding Contribution in Ophthalmic Education 2020. And that's a prestigious award. Welcome, sir. And we're more than happy that you have agreed to cover such an important topic with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rolika. Um, that was very kind of you to have introduced me that way. Um, thank And especially thank you for the topic that has been assigned to me, uh, which you say is very important uh, from the post budget point of view. So let me straight away start by sharing my screen. So, yeah. So I'll be giving in the next 45 minutes an overview of uh, lasers in retinal diseases, uh, which I prepared specially for this iFocus uh, program this evening. Uh, I'll be covering these uh, various, uh, this topic under these various headings, that is the laser basics the types of lasers and the wavelengths that are used, the delivery modes that are employed in uh, treating the patients, uh, and the different examples of uh, retinal diseases for which lasers are used. And of course, some of the complications that may arise out of laser treatment and the newer lasers, uh, I think this will cover the uh, topic from the examination point of view as well. So laser actually is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, a basic laser consists of a cavity uh, with the laser material and a mirror on each end and a flash tube. So this is the coil is the flash tube and these are the two mirrors. The burst of light from the flash tube adds energy inside the cavity, exciting the atoms and producing light particles called photons. We all know these basics. These photons strike the atoms, creating more and more photons bouncing back and forth between the mirrors in the cavity. And that is how the laser energy is, is uh, produced. And this, when it becomes great, uh, they pass through one of the mirrors, which is actually partly reflective and the laser beam emerges from there. So this laser beam is a monochromatic, that is a single wavelength beam, which is also coherent. So that is about the basics of laser physics. The common wavelengths of laser, uh, which we use, uh, in retinal disease are these. I think this, this is again an important slide for you all to know what are the various wavelengths of uh, laser that are used. Argon green, diode green, and frequency double D are all coming within the green range of the visible spectrum. The yellow laser, is, which is uh, commonly employed, is a 577 nanometer yellow laser. The PDT laser is a 689 nanometer laser, which comes in the red category. And diode red, which is used uh, for TTT as well as for treatment of uh, focal laser in uh, um, certain tumors for uh, ROP laser and so on. And for, of course, the coloboma of the uh, retinochoroidal coloboma for um, retinal detachment associated with that. And the neodymium YAG laser all come in the infrared range that is more than 750 nanometers, usually 810 nanometers. The laser type and the effects of retinal, corresponding effects of retinal lasers are like this. Photocoagulation, transpupillary thermotherapy and photofermentation all have a thermal effect on the retina by which the patient is benefited and the, the condition is treated. Vertiporfin photodynamic therapy is, uh, is a modality which works through photoactivation. Photostimulation is with the SML, that is a subthreshold micropulse laser and photodisruption or uh, 
uh, what we use for, for example, a common application in, in cataract surgery or anti-segment is the Yagli's capsulotomy is also used in the retina. I will show some examples of that. What uh, ND uh, laser can do to the retina in terms of amelioration of the patient's disease, uh, I'm going to cover under photo disruption. We also know, uh, need to know about the grade of laser burns uh, from sub visible to barely visible to threshold and supra threshold. We may also call them grade, grade one, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. And this is dependent on the not on the uh, spot size, but on the duration of the laser and the power that is employed. There are various delivery systems that uh, can be used for laser delivery. Uh, the slit lamp delivery, which is the most commonly used, you can see the, uh, the picture on the right, which we commonly use for most of the treatments in uh, retinal diseases. The LIO, which is used for certain um, the uh, retinal peripheral retinal diseases like uh, filling the PRP or tightening the PRP in the periphery or for a treatment of a retinal tear or a laser barrage for a retinal uh, lattice degeneration or for ROP laser and endo laser for treatment in, during surgery. During surgery, for example, a P a PDR surgery, a diabetic vitrectomy where you want to do an endo laser to do an endo PRP can be performed with the endo laser using an endo probe. And we have the integrated imaging and delivery system or a machine that is called the Navilas, where we have an imaging system and a laser delivery system integrated into one, which I'm going to talk about in the end. So the common indications for laser treatment, let us see some examples. So this is a patient who has, uh, obviously this has a neovascularization in the uh, retina everywhere. You can see in both the eyes, this is a bilateral case. Incidentally, I've, I've chosen this slide because this patient has six by six vision in both the eyes, yet he has high risk PDR. So this is a patient with C-fan neovascularization. You can see here within the circles, uh, everywhere there is uh, neovascularization elsewhere. And this subhyoid hemorrhage here, which looks to actually like, which can be mistaken for a blood vessel. So this is something that is in need of an urgent PRP uh, as per the DRS study guidelines. So this patient has to undergo laser panretinal photocoagulation. So panretinal photocoagulation, some of the examples which we see in our day-to-day -day practice, just a few laser burns around the arcades is, th is all that some people think that panretinal photocoagulation is about, but it is not really. So this is another example of a wrongly done <coughs> sorry, PRP. So the, what is the right way to do a PRP? Uh, I would request Dr. Rajneesh Singh to please mute the mic. Right. So this is the right way to do a PRP. We have the parameters there on the right side of the slide. Spot size, 200 microns, duration 0.05 to 0.1 second, or if you can say 50 to 100 milliseconds. Power is something that is very, very variable depending on the patient. It depends on the patient's age, depends on the patient's lens status. For example, in nuclear uh, sclerosis, can um, uh, will will need a higher power for the laser to pass through, or a cataract will need a higher power of laser to pass through. Uh, a, a young patient, for example, a young diabetic, for example, we need very less, little power for a given reaction. So this 300 to 600 is the is the range that we keep. Uh, it is not a fixed number, unlike the spot size. So we, what we aim at is a grade three burn. So what I showed you already, the different grades of uh, laser uh, burns. So what we aim at in PRP is a grade three burn. So, and the spacing is one burn width apart. So we start with inferior retina like this. It is usually done in divided sessions. The first session is usually with treatment of the inferior retina. <coughs> I'm sorry. And a, a barrier laser here, a marking to cut off the um, innermost point of the temporal retina. So this is about usually about three disc diameters away from the fovea. And this is the line which we teach our juniors or fellows not to enter inside. So this is the marking that we make on the first session, inferior retina and the temporal marking, followed by treatment of the rest of the retina, starting beginning nasally, then superiorly, 
you can see the laser being treatment being done virtually and this is the end of treatment so by the end of treatment the entire retina is treated up to the up to the periphery say equator uh, with uh, which is all the contact lens uh, mode of delivery is uh, uh, you know is effective meaning uh, with the contact lens and the slit lamp it is possible to treat this much of retina which is fairly enough for most of the cases of pdr but if there are if there is persistent neovascularization either of the disc or of the or in the uh, or elsewhere or in the periphery then we need to fill up this laser or tighten this laser or do a more peripheral laser with with the lio or the laser indirect ophthalmoscope which i alluded to already and then this results in a regression of the neovascularization that is persisting so the mechanism of uh, action of laser is by ablation of the ischemic retina. So this is a photo ablative. Photocoagulation is basically a destructive procedure. Ablation of the ischemic retina uh, resulting in decreased VEGF production and other growth factors that are responsible for driving the formation and maintenance of these neovascularization, which, which is the source of uh, fibrovascular, uh, attendant fibrovascular proliferation causing PRD or hemorrhage causing uh, vitreous hemorrhage. So this is a, uh, a very novel uh, method of treating. See, what I showed you in divided sessions with a single spot is now overcome by what is called the pattern scan laser uh, or the Pascal laser. And the advantages are that there is a preset pattern of laser which can be programmed, which can be chosen from, this, from the various options available in the machine where uh, we can choose up to a 64 grid, meaning eight by eight square of uh, laser burns which are given or delivered to the retina at a time. With one press of the foot pedal, you are able to deliver 64 spots of laser. And with this, it becomes the treatment becomes faster. The patient is more comfortable. What, what otherwise would take 20, 25 minutes will be over in five to six minutes. And because of the short exposure time that this particular technology uh, adopts, that is just 20 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds as compared to 0.1 to one second or 100 milliseconds of the conventional laser, there is less pain less inflammation as a result of less uh, spread of the laser burn. And therefore, the inflammation is not much and more, um, more treatment can be done in one setting. Most of the treatment, in fact, can be done in one setting. The patient is usually called after one month for a follow-up by when we see whether the laser is adequate or not. And only if necessary, a second, a small second setting will be required. So this allows faster treatment with similar effect and less collateral damage. Uh, that is about Pascal laser, which is employed for panretinal photocoagulation and, in fact, any other laser application. So just to show you the difference between single spot and the Pascal laser, this is what you see on the right hand side towards the disc. Closer to the disc is what we have done with the pattern. And this is something that has been done with the conventional laser. You can see that there is a difference in the uniformity of the burns, both in the spacing and the uniformity of the burns. There is a difference and this is what Pascal laser scores over the conventional laser. So just to show you some pre and post uh, treatment uh, pictures of uh, PRP being done uh, in our institute, uh, with the, and the pictures are taken with the Optos uh, Daytona machine, and uh, this is how it looks uh, post treatment. This is another example. So what can happen with with laser treatment? What complications can happen? So if there is already a macular edema, there can be aggravation of the macular edema. There can be choroidal effusion because of the inflammation setting. There is an inflammatory choroidal effusion. There can be sometimes fibrin reaction in the vitreous causing the vitreitis as well. But, and a secondary glaucoma, secondary angle closure glaucoma. Once there is a choroidal detachment, there is a forward bowing of the ciliary body or ciliary processes against the iris causing a shallowing of the anterior chamber in the periphery and this in turn can lead to secondary angle closure glaucoma but none of these are significant in the long run in the in the long term because all of them are self-limiting the macular edema will subside the choroidal effusion will subside the vitreitis will subside secondary angle closure glaucoma will subside and the only care that you have to take is to keep the uh, keep the power uh, within the parameters that has been uh, set as per the guidelines, and also try to divide this treatment into multiple sessions in a in a say in a vulnerable vulnerable patient. Then the other complications are night vision difficulty that some patients usually complain of, and field restrictions uh, that the patient may complain driving difficulty during day and at night 
it becomes all the more difficult. And these are something that actually would happen even if laser treatment is not done because of the ongoing ischemia. So this is something which I would not like to attribute it to the laser per se. Although laser can precipitate these complications a little earlier, this is bound to happen in the long run as the patient uh, progresses in his uh, disease, uh, as the disease progresses and the ischemia continues. Then there is this PVD induced vitreous hemorrhage. Posterior vitreous detachment can occur either due to laser or even otherwise. And there's a precipitation of TRD or attraction retinal detachment, both of which again are possible with the ongoing disease itself and not necessarily due to laser. So I would like to say that uh, benefits of laser weigh fav favorably against the complications and we need not tell the patient that there will be a complication due to the laser. If at all there's a complication, it's going to be due to the disease and not due to the laser per se. So this is just an example to show you uh, that uh, after treatment, there is regression of the neovascularization um, and <clears throat> there is this fibrous tissue formation, which eventually has, because of the intrinsic uh, uh, property of contraction, will cause a TR, TRD and uh, this TRD may extend to the macula causing a macular TRD. So this is something that can happen even without laser. And therefore, um, uh, as I said, we need not uh, list, list this particular compl uh, complication in the, compl in the list of complications due to laser. So laser for diabetic macular edema is another thing that we have to know. Uh, it is not being used uh, in the present day much by many uh, ophthalmologists. Uh, it, if at all it is used, it is used for center non-involving diabetic macular edema. And one need to know this because uh, examiners are still fond of asking uh, the different more techniques of uh, laser uh, which were used in the past. Although it is not used today, they will ask you what is grid laser. So this is a ETDRS macular grid laser, which is a horseshoe shaped or a C-shaped, inverted C-shaped pattern laser, which used to be employed during the days of the ETDRS study. <coughs> And in fact, until anti-VEGF came in, the, in 2005, this was the only modality of treatment, although it underwent certain modifications like the M-ATDRS or the modified ATDRS grid laser, where the target used to be the areas of thickening as identified by 90D. In fact, OCT was not there. So based on 90D examination, there used to be this identification of areas of thickening of the retina and targeting the areas of thickening and the microaneurysms, causing microaneurysm blanching or whitening, they used to call it. And this is a modified ETDRS. And then the DRCR.net, which is a multicentric trial of, of uh, which studies uh, exclusively diabetic uh, conditions, uh, they um, devised this new technique of MMG or mild macular grid where small mild burns are placed throughout the macula in areas with and without edema. Whether there is edema or not, it is uniformly something like a grid laser, which was done by the ETDRS uh, protocol. So there is no direct treatment of microaneurysms, and uh, this is also as effective as the MATDRS. So there are the th these three laser techniques, the, gr the grid, ETDRS grid, the modified ETDRS grid, and the mild macular grid are the three laser techniques you should know from the examination point of view when it comes to treatment of diabetic macular edema. So the, what, are the, what is the presumed mechanism of uh, focal laser? So there is closure of microneurysms. There is reduced blood flow because of uh, occlusion of these uh, leaking capillaries leading to autoregulation and reduced edema. There is stimulation of biochemical processes in RPE. And there is a possible alternative route created for the edema to resolve through the choroid. So these are the, this is hypothetical, but it is possible. So these are the presumed mechanisms of how does focal laser, if the examiner asks, how does focal laser work in diabetic macular edema? Probably this is the list of the answers that you have to give and complications of focal laser. In fact, unlike with PRP, the complications of focal laser are more. There is destruction because we are working close to the fovea, there can be an inadvertent fo foveal burn. There is destruction of photoreceptors. There can be paracentral or even central scotomas. And because these burns can enlarge with time, there's a lateral creep of, and the enla enlargement of the scotomas as well. Subfoveal fibrosis is something that can happen. Hard exudates can accumulate at the fovea by migration. And if the laser burn is intense and deep, it can result in a CNVM added to, to the diabetic macular edema and patients sometimes, sometimes complain of color vision impairment. 
Coming to the next indication, we finished with PDR and diabetic macular edema. Vasculitis is another, another disease that is uh, treatable by laser, not in the active stage as in this, definitely not in the active stage as in this, but in, in a stage of proliferation when, see the, the vasculitis runs through three phases, the active phase or the inflammatory phase. Then there is an obliterative phase where there is sheathing of the vessels, the eye becomes quiet, but there is sheathing of the vessels and gradually proliferation sets in. So these three phases are, uh, are need not be treated except the last one that is a proliferative phase when laser is employed. Similar and the rash tail is similar to similar to treatment of diabetic retin uh, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so basically you wait for inflammation to subside, identify the prolifer uh, proliferation either by clinically or by angiography and treat areas of the sclerosis vessels and around, around and beyond the neovascularization. So that is a technique that is employed for um, laser photocoagulation in vasculitis. Vein occlusions again can cause uh, can cause problems and that to some extent have been uh, taken care of by laser. We have seen, we have heard about the BVO study. Laser again is not a very uh, well uh, practiced treatment for branch vein occlusion, but there are some uh, indications. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> so basically uh, the BVO study said that in a branch retinal vein occlusion, wait for three months for clearance of hemorrhage do a fluorescein angiography after the clearance of hemorrhage. It may be three months or even six months. And if the vision is less than 2040, that is six by 36, I'm sorry, six by 12, then if on angiography you see perfused vascular, uh, perfused perifoveal network, that is if more than 180 degrees of the perifoveal capillary network is intact, then you do a macular grid laser for and follow up for every, every uh, follow up this patient every two to three months. So this is an example of a macular grid laser in a BRVO. The other thing that the BVO study said that uh, in a branch vein occlusion, if the perfusion is, is the non-perfusion is more than five disc diameters, then you follow up these patients for uh, forever for four months at four monthly intervals. And if new vascularization sets in like this, then you have to do a scatter laser photocoagulation. If new vascularization sets in like the one in the in the FFA picture and one in the clinical picture here, can you have to do a sectoral laser treatment? And these are some examples of sectoral laser being done to the areas of non-perfusion to take care of or to cause a regression of the neovascularization that uh, sets in in some cases of branch vein occlusion, which is usually about fifty percent. So these are two examples of sectoral laser being done for BVO PRVO. Now, a word about ultra wide field fluorescein angiography in PDR, DME, and RVO. So what what they did was the in fact i would like to I would proudly say that ravi patel and sino hari prasad both uh, nris of indian origin uh, started this technique uh, they did an ultra wide field angiography to find out areas of ischemia even after laser treatment if there was persistent neovascularization they did an ultra find uh, ultra wide field angiography to find out if there are any uh, areas that have been left behind untreated uh, based on the angiographic finding. And if they found that the ischemic index, they calculated the ischemic index, which is again a software dependent uh, um, uh, observation. Uh, if the ischemic index was more than 45%, they, they thought that it would be better to treat these patients in the, uh, in the areas that have not been treated. And that is how the macular edema, the VEGF drive for the macular edema would come down. And this is known as targeted retinal treatment. So we know, know about PRP, we should also know about TRP or targeted retinal photocoagulation. So this will decrease the ischemic drive and the cytokine release and ultimately reduce the retinal vascular leakage and DME. So this is the treatment that is done for uh, PDR uh, by TRP. In vein occlusions also, FFA guided TRP can be done targeted retinal photocoagulation, which reduces the VEGF load and reduces need for injections for macular edema. CSCR is another condition where there is a limited indication for laser and the treatment is usually done when there is no resolution, resolution of the CSR even after three months. If the, if the episodes are recurrent, when the previous episode of CSR has resulted in residual vision loss or if the occupation demands an early visual recovery, for example, a driver or a pilot who needs accurate vision or clear vision at, a, at an early uh, uh, date following the onset of the disease, 
uh, for his res resumption of duties. So this is something that can be treated by focal laser if it is an extrafocal leak on the angiogram or by PDT or, or, or sub-threshold micropulse laser about which I'll talk to, uh, talk to you all about in a minute. Uh, so this is the angiogram that is uh, being done and you can see that there's a point leakage to begin with which slowly enlarges and becomes an ink plot. So uh, this is not the picture that you would choose to do the focal laser. You will choose the early frames where, where the, there's a pinpoint leak and this is the point that has to be treated with mild grade two burns, what we call as photo fermentation. So what they do is we uh, a hundred micron spot size is selected by 0 0.05 second duration is selected and a, and a grade two burn is created using either uh, for starting from 200 to 300 milliwatts of power. And a couple of spots are placed at the site of leakage with the angiographic guide. So we keep the angiogram at the in, in the laser room in a, a picture of the angiogram of the early frame in the laser room as a guide to treatment. So, yeah. so here again, we should be very careful that we should avoid grade three or four burns because the scotoma can enlarge and the laser induced CNVM is a well-known complication of uh, uh, treatment with uh, laser for CSR. Another indication is CNVM and PCV when they are extrafoveal. Uh, although there are better treatments in the form of anti vegfs and uh, other drugs, pharmacotherapy for these conditions. So, uh, there are certain indications for laser. This example, this is, for example, a 57-year-old female with a sudden loss of vision uh, with uh, patient came with 6 by 18 with a drop of vision. This was the picture is massive subretinal hemorrhage. And this is the OCT picture to show the that the retina per se is intact. The neurosensor retina is intact, but there's PED is there, which is hemorrhagic in nature. And there's a massive subretinal hemorrhage causing metamorphopsia and loss of vision, near vision. So uh, we did a uh, fluorescent angiography and an ICGA week after pneumatic displacement. The hemorrhage was too huge uh, to be treated uh, by laser or to even identify the, the lesion. So we did a pneumatic this, this displacement with C3F8 gas and positioning. And a week later, we did an FFA and ICGA. And uh, after that, an injection of ILIA was given. And a month later, the BVN, or now it is called the BNN, actually, branching neovascular network and the polyps were lasered. And after laser, you can see these laser marks here, the confluent laser of the BVN. I'll go back to the previous slide to show you the BVN. This is the BV BNN with the polyps here. And the focal laser to that resulted in complete resolution of the lesion. And till today, that is even after two and a half years, there has been no, no recurrence of this condition. So patient is enjoying good vision, of course, with a small central scotoma, uh, paracentral scotoma uh, in the field of vision. So another condition where laser is employed is laser prophylaxis for retinal degenerations and breaks and laser therapy for retinal detachment. So this is a schematic to show you um, that laser treatment is, is mandatory when there is a lattice degeneration, especially when associated with a retinal break or a tear. So the indications are here, high degree of myopia, symptomatic lattice degeneration and holes, extensive and posteriorly located lesions, a cuff of SRF around the lesion, uh, retinal detachment in the fellow eye, a family history of retinal detachment, and of course, as a precautionary measure before refractive surgery, uh, you should have a low threshold for prophylaxis. So this is an example of a barrier laser to prevent progression. There is an HST with a cuff of SRF here, and this is the barrier laser that is in all around it. Uh, this incidentally has uh, multiple uh, tears. One has been treated a week ago, and this patient comes back with another tear because, because the, the process of PVD or posterior vitreous detachment is an ongoing process which goes on for several months sometimes. And every visit, there'll be a new tear. And this is in, uh, incidentally with a cuff of SRF, and this has to be immediately lasered. So these patients have to be kept under close watch even after the laser treatment. Uh, detachment is something uh, which we can treat with laser. Uh, with along with pneumatic retinopexy. So, so pneumatic retinopexy, there are two components in that. The pneumo is the gas injection and pexy is the laser treatment. For a superiorly located rectal break causing rectal detachment, we inject a gas because of the buoyancy and surface tension of gas. It is, it is possible to re reattach the, the retina, as you can see in these schematics here. And following reattachment, laser treatment can be applied to the attached break either uh, without indentation or with indentation as the 
condition of the SRF may be in that particular area, and we can cause a good uh, result with the pneumatic retinopexy. So laser again comes in handy even as a therapy in retinal detachment apart from the prophylaxis that I talked about. Coarse disease is something that uh, is uh, in uh, the the uh, childhood coats is something which we usually cannot treat with laser treatment because it is usually advanced by the time they come which is a leukocoria there is massive subretinal exudation and it is sometimes possible some most of the time impossible because the exudation can sometimes be drained and the retina to some extent reattached and anti vegf can be given and sometimes laser can be done. But in most cases, in childhood coats, it is not possible. But in adult coats, because the patient presents early, it is possible to treat these patients with laser by targeting these macro aneurysms or miliary aneurysms, as we, we may call it, at cause reduction in exudation and the edema of the macula. FEVR is another condition where um, it's actually a heredo uh, hereditary condition and a familial condition. Uh, in fact, all the family members have to be examined in uh, this condition. So there is a uh, ischemia of the extreme peripheral retina resulting in neovascularization, sometimes subretinal exudation in the periphery, which in the early stages can be treated with laser and a lot of uh, benefit can be obtained by laser treatment. Uh, of course, nowadays we can combine this laser treatment with anti of injections uh, prior to the laser treatment. So this is a case of a circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. You can see this uh, circular area, circular tumor, uh, nasal to the disc, fortunately. Just a second. So, the, yeah. So doing, when we do doing angiography, you can actually delineate the area of the circumscribed choroidal hemangioma which shows this hyperfluorescence in the later phases of the angiogram. And this is, this is the simple focal laser that we applied to this street, to this area. This results in good resolution. You can see the scarring two months later. This is a picture taken two months later. So laser treatment also can be employed for choroidal hemangioma when it is away from the fovea or in the nasal retina. Transpupillary thermotherapy is something that uh, is still there today, but it is probably getting outdated. But uh, the indications that it was uh, the indications for which it was developed is uh, probably the subfoveal CNVM. Low intensity, long duration laser resulting in slow heating is the rationale of this particular modality of treatment. There is decreased collateral damage to the retina because it's a slow uh, heating and possibly a better visual outcome than the conventional laser. And this was employed for, for uh, the subfoveal CNVMs. And there are different uh, ranges of heating, 40 to 42 to 44 degrees for the CNVMs, 45 to 60 degrees for the tumors. Higher than 60 degrees is not used in ophthalmology, but used for coagulative necrosis in general surgery. Uh, it is done under topical anesthesia. Visualization of the CNVM is done with the uh, angiogram, and an appropriate uh, spot size is selected and. This is the CNVM, which is rather flat in this particular patient, and treatment is applied using a spot size anywhere between 0.8 to 3 millimeters. So the spot size is highly is, is something that we should know that it is possible to go up to 3 millimeters of spot size. A power of a very high power of 1 to 1.25 watt compared to the 300 milliwatts or 500 milliwatts that we use with the conventional laser, we use a higher wattage, and the application also is one minute. So the basic idea is to heat up the tumor. Uh, to heat up the tumor and cause its, its resolution by the slow heating. So parameters are based on a test burn. There's no visible endpoint. So at the end of the, the, there's a test burn that is used to begin to begin with, but at the end of the treatment, there is no visible endpoint, or there may be a subtle change in the form of a slight change in color. <coughs> yeah. Although this treatment was developed for treatment of subfoveal CNVMs, now it is extended to tumors like retinoblastoma, choroidal melanoma, and uh, circumscribed choroidal hemangioma as well. So some examples of pre-TTT and post-TTT uh, pictures of uh, CNVMs, similarly here. Small choroidal melanoma is being treated with TTT. You can see the, the, the difference uh, after uh, three years. You can see that there is total resolution. And even the B-scan shows, even the B-scan here shows 
uh, almost flattening of the uh, tumors tumor and uh, the elevation is totally gone so it can be used in combination with brachytherapy in a larger tumor with a high elevation it can be uh, attacked from both sides you can put a radioactive applicator a brachytherapy uh, applicator on the sclera outside and treat the inner part of the tumor with ttt and with this way we can take care of even bigger tumors and higher tumors thicker tumors ttt for small retinoblastomas can also ttt can also be employed for small retinoblastomas when i say small i mean less than 3 mm 3 mm or less both for melanoma and retinoblastoma small means 3 mm or less choroidal uh, circumscribed choroidal hemangioma involving the posterior pole we saw the one which was nasal to the disc in the previous slide and here it is right at the fovea just uh, maybe involving part of the fovea as well which is quite big and here again ttt can be employed and this causes resolution photodynamic therapy is another uh, uh, type of laser that we use and uh, here uh, what we do is a selective vasoocclusive treatment that targets choroidal vascular abnormalities initially developed to treat an nmd just like ttt uh, it is now extended to the treatment of choroidal hemangioma central serous choroidal retinopathy polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy and peripapillary choroidal vascularization and there are safety enhanced we uh, vertiporfin photodynamic therapy protocols because of these uh, collateral damage that the you know, standard treatment sometimes causes we have the safety enhanced low fluence low dose or reduced dose uh, vertiporfin from 6 mg it is brought to 6 3 mg and um, instead of 50 joules per centimeter square it is reduced to 25 joules per centimeter square in treatment of especially csr so what it does is there is a, in this treatment uh, modality the it, what this involves is an injection of a photosensitizing dye visudine or vertiporfin visudine is a brand name activation by low intensity light that is the laser light of 689 nanometers which results in a photochemical inter interaction producing single ox uh, singlet oxygen and superoxide an anions and this in turn results in cellular damage by vascular occlusion and thrombosis so this is the Uh, the basic ra rationale or the mechanism by which photodynamic therapy works so this is done for cnv lesions less than 5400 microns uh with a, in a in a patient with 660 to 612 vision a spot size is usually 1000 microns more than the size of the lesion for example if the bleach if the lesion is 5400 microns which is actually the size of the macula uh, the the spot size will be 6400 microns which is which is all the machine can achieve this results in a complete uh, treatment because we have to keep an alliance for eye movement and also try to treat 550 microns on either side of uh, i'm sorry 500 microns on either side of the lesion so in fact all around the lesion so that is why that the 1000 microns is added to the lesion to the lesion size as a spot size 6 mg 30 ml infusion over 10 mm 10 minutes 15 minutes later after the injection the laser is applied and this again you have to remember 50 joules per centimeter square in the standard treatment which which is actually 600 milliwatts per centimeter square for 83 seconds so these are figures which we have to memorize uh it's important in the exam sometimes they will ask so but the cost of this treatment is prohibitive and it is not in fact it is it has become unavailable in the present day in the last two years we have not been no one of us in india has done a single photodynamic therapy because of lack of availability of the vertiporfin uh, dye and the indications will be csr with foveal leak cnvm uh, which is subfoveal pcv which is again subfoveal and tumors of the posterior pole so what happens is uh, with pdt damage occurs there is damage it occurs only to the lesion the whole lesion and nothing but the lesion so this is something we have to remember so there is no collateral damage or very little collateral damage and that is why this treatment used to be preferred uh, all this was before the era of anti vegf treatment so some examples of pdt uh, another uh, modality of treatment is uh, cineangiography icga uh, was used in this uh, cineangiography guided um feeder vessel treatment to treat the feeder vessels so identification of the uh, feeder vessels was done by angiography and 
direct treatment to the feeder vessels was done. Again, this is difficult. This is not reproducible. This is technically difficult and not possible in every case. And therefore, it has not been practiced recently by many ophthalmologists. Uh, coming to laser treatment for of ROP, I think this is something that is one of the most dramatic in terms of the treatment outcomes that we see. If at all there is one condition where there is magical change in the eye, it is ROP after laser treatment. We can see the results within three to four days. That is the beauty of laser treatment for ROP. It is done when there is threshold disease. Uh, or in a case of AP ROP, aggressively posterior ROP, sometimes after anti vegf injections, if, if the pupil is not dilating and it's not possible to do the laser treatment, uh, we can give an anti vegf injection, usually ranibizumab, following which we follow the patient every uh, week, initially every two weeks later and every month thereafter. And before 50 weeks of age, uh, a laser treatment has to be uh, done as a supplement to the anti of treatment in order to complete the treatment for ROP. So this is something we have to remember. And again, I would like to reiterate that the most satisfying results we get with laser treatment uh, in, in this particular disease. So these are some examples of laser being done for ROP. Coming to the newer advances. Uh, well, this is, uh, I've not put the title here. This is a, a video which will show you what, what subthreshold micropulse laser is. So, so what happens in, in a conventional laser is in a continuous wave pulse, CW stands for continuous wave. In a continuous wave output, there is a beam which is targeted on the retina for about 100 milliseconds or even, even if it is less, it will be 80 milliseconds in order to get a reaction. And with this, what happens is there is a deeper penetration of the laser and there's a wider expansion of the laser and this results in a visible burn. <coughs> Sorry. And this results in a visible burn. So this is the conventional laser. You can see the visible burn there. But if the same beam were chopped into multiple train of pulses, the same continuous wave were chopped into multiple train of, of pulses. And if each pulse was delivered at a time uh, for a given time and then allowed to, and the tissue allowed to cool before the second wave, second uh, pulse comes, for example, I'm going to show the complete video now. So you can see that this comes repeatedly and there is a chain of train of pulses that is coming and there is a cooling time in between. So this continuous beam is chopped into multiple pulses this and which allows the cooling of tissue between the laser pulses and this gives the same effect as the continuous pulse but there is cooling and because of this there is less collateral damage so this is the beauty of subthreshold micropulse laser which is employed very frequently by many of the in the present day and this is a uh, and these are the conditions dme even when center involving is, is, is one of the indications for SML or subthreshold micropulse laser. CSCR with foveal leak, which, we, which for which we had to depend on, on PDT uh, till last year or till two years ago when Tipoffin when was available. Now we have the subthreshold micropulse laser and macular edema for RVO. So for any macular edema involving the fovea and for CSC leaks at the fovea, we can employ uh, SML or subthreshold micropulse laser. There's another laser called the multicolor or MC laser, which again uh, came in with a bang, but uh, now we have not been uh, uh, exposed to this uh, very frequently in the industry. You can see that there is uh, there are three colors in this. This is all integrated into one machine. There's a green, there's a yellow, and there's a red. And uh, there are different indications. Uh, three popular wavelengths, 532 green and 577 yellow are available for which uh, uh, the indications will be uh, a PDR, for example, for which uh, you want to do a PRP. And then we have, uh, for the lesions near the macula, a yellow laser can be employed, which causes less collateral damage. And when there is hemorrhage, you can use the red laser because of its better, better penetrance. So there are uh, three popular wavelengths available in one machine, which is called the multicolor laser by NIDEC company. Coming to the final thing, the navigated laser therapy. Uh, or the Navilas, 
that's the brand name for this this uh, particular modality of treatment so this uh, integrates imaging and laser delivery in one so there is imaging a real high time uh, real time high definition imaging of the posterior pole and periphery is done followed by digital planning with image integration and analysis i'll come to that in a minute and this plan is overlaid on the the, the different uh, modality of the multimodal imaging uh, pictures are are integrated into th the machine for its analysis it, there is a software which analyzes what power or what parameter to use for which particular point on the retina to that extent we have the precision and then the treatment is done uh, just with the trigger uh, just with the press of the trigger and this can be documented as well so this is something that is very very novel and very very exciting uh, it, as it seems so there, there is this uh, powerful fundus camera and the, the it's uh, it's very very ex exciting to know to know that this can be employed uh, it's non contact as well uh, doesn't need any contact lens and patient is very very comfortable you can have long gaps in between if, if the patient feels uncomfortable for some reason you can always ask the patient to lean back you can lean back you can go back to exer, uh, see the plan you can go back to change the treatment parameters so that's the beauty of uh, navilas treatment so i think these are some examples so over this is what i meant by overlay of the various uh, imaging modalities this is the ffa with the my leaking microneurisms and this is the overlay of the of the oct and these are the marks on the retina which are actually the the um, uh, points points of treatment which the, which the machine has decided so we can do uh, focal laser we can do pan retinal photocoagulation you can do uh, pattern scan uh, also is available with this machine and therefore you can see the uniformity of the burns and uh, the treatment is really uh, uh, very very effective and beautiful coming to the last uh, um, laser application that i will be talking about laser in the vitreous cavity so basically yag laser is something that we all know is used in capsulotomy uh, yag laser capsulotomy but it can also be used for yag laser vitreolysis and here is an example so here we have a subhyoid hemorrhage or a sub ilm hemorrhage which is a highly raised one at that and uh, this is something that will take months to to cause a pvd and dislodge from there if the patient is is uh, an executive and wants clear vision immediately one of the methods by which you can try to alleviate the patient's symptom is to do a yag helotomy and see the result you apply a laser burn with the yag laser and disrupt the ilm or this or the posterior hyoid here and the blood will just flow out from there and you have this clear posterior pole patient recovers vision almost instantaneously if not within a day or two <coughs> and the other indication is uh, floaterectomy patients with annoying floaters some patients keep coming to us every month they come till recently we were not offering them any treatment we were telling them that they have to live with it it is part it is physiological it's not pathological and they have to live with it because just because uh, modern vitrectomy uh, techniques were not available mivs was not available nowadays we are doing vitrectomy but then with vitrectomy there is the young patient developing a cataract if he has a clear lens a young patient will develop a cataract if he has a floater and you offer him vitrectomy so that is not acceptable so we have this alternative method of floaterectomy you can see that the float with the yag laser it is possible to disrupt this floaters uh, cut it off into small bits and cause its dissolution over time so it also causes liquefaction of the surrounding vitreous because of which these these uh, fragments that you have created by the laser vitreolysis settles down to the bottom and the patient usually is free of symptoms so i think with this i i conclude my um, talk on lasers in retinal diseases uh, i have given you fair overview of of what all we can do to uh, the retinal diseases with laser uh, thank you very much i'll be very happy to take questions uh, dr rolika all yours now thank you so much sir that has covered retinal uh, diseases and lasers all in all in all in, in fact you made them revise all the trials too so that was not just lasers it was a major overview for all the retinal diseases in short 
So there are a few questions that the viewers have for you. Uh, sir, may I ask the questions to you, sir? Yeah, please. Okay, sir. So first question is that while using lasers with anti-VEGF for DME, how are the two treatments, uh, two treatments planned? Like when to start the injections and how many and how to start laser? When should we wait for the macula to dry? Yeah. Uh, well, if you are planning laser treatment, for example, uh, laser treatment is planned only for non-centered involving diabetic macular edema. If you're talking about diabetic macular edema, yes. it is for non-centered involving diabetic macular edema. But if it is centered involving diabetic macular edema, even then laser treatment is possible, provided the foveal part of the foveal component of the diabetic macular edema is taken care of by pharmacotherapy to, to begin with. So we give a, a treatment. Uh, it may be anything. It may be uh, steroid. It may be anti-VEGF, whatever it is. And only when when the edema subsides, we do an angio-guided angiography, uh, an angio-guided laser therapy, tar targeted laser photocoagulation to the microaneurysms, to the leaking microaneurysms and to areas of thickening as identified by the pre-injection OCT. So based on this, it is possible to um, reduce the edema after the uh, anti vegf has taken its effect, meaning if the treatment is done, if the laser treatment is done in the, with the edema in place, meaning if the edema is still there, then the amount of laser that would go in to cause a desired burn, to cause a particular grade of burn would be very heavy because, uh, ret because of the retinal thickness. As compared to an, a retina that has been treated by anti vegf or uh, by any form, form of pharmacotherapy, by when the retina would have reduced in thickness and the RPE would be closer to the inner internal limiting membrane and therefore the laser energy that would be expended in, in creating a particular type of grade of burn would be much less. So both ways, the ease of treatment and also the, the safety of treatment is better if the laser treatment is done after a trial of anti vegf or after a, um, say a gap of two weeks after the anti vegf yeah. Thank you for that protocol to be followed. So there's a question by Sony that uh, where is photostimulation and retina laser used? Photostimulation, as I said, is uh, is is a mechanism by which the subthreshold micro micropulse laser works. So what happens in subthreshold micropulse laser is that the RPE is tickled. They say it's actually the word tickled is used. So it is stimulated, it is tickled uh, by which the RPE starts functioning better. It is woken up from its sleep. Some of the dying RPE is woken up from its sleep. You can use such words if, uh, you, if, uh, if you don't consider me too poetic. <laughs> it is they, uh, actually they start refunctioning because of this reactivation by photostimulation. The other photostimulation that I was talking about is vertiporfin uh, PDT, where there is photostimulation and photoactivation of dye. The dye that is there is photoactivated by uh, light of a particular wavelength. And this in turn results in singlet oxygen release and anionic uh, release, which causes uh, accumulation of uh, platelet, aggreg aggregation of platelets within the capillary, dead within the disease capillaries, causing them to occlude and uh, thromb thrombosis ensues, and the new vascularizations uh, gets sort of blocked altogether. So that is uh, what photo activation and photo stimulation are all about. Right, yeah. sir. And so while we are at it, could you could you please clarify for the postgraduates the terms like photo ablation? photo vaporization and photo disruption because many of us have not had retinal exposure in post graduation so I, I think it would be nice for them to know the difference between the terms uh, well photo vaporization is something that is used in general surgery it is not used in ophthalmology uh, photo uh, coagulation or uh, thermal laser is uh, the one that we normally use for ablation meaning uh, for uh, uh, killing ablation basically means uh, causing the anoxic retina into, uh, sorry, hypoxic retina into anoxic retina, by which the VEGF producing substance, producing retina, the suffocated retina, the, the suffocated retina or the ischemic retina that is producing the VEGF is, is taken care of, is knocked off, and by because of which the VEGF is no longer produced. And this VEGF drive, which on which the 
uh, new vascularization is dependent to be uh, on its maintenance and uh, bleeding is, re is reduced and that results in re regression. So that is photocoagulation or photoablation. Photo vaporization is not used in, it's used in general surgery. Uh, photo deception, I have already told it is for uh, uh, yeah, laser, uh, hyalotomy, and for plotorectomy. Uh, the other is uh, photo activation, I just told you about the vertiporphin PDT. And uh, photo the stimulation, stimulation, photo stimulation is the subthreshold micropulse laser. So yes. these are the different uh, mechanisms by which laser works for retinal diseases. Okay, sir. Yeah. So there, there's a question that what is the mechanism on which, like mechanism on retina, uh, the basis of mechanism of retina, uh, the laser and macular laser, sorry. So the laser and macular treatment versus the laser and PRP. What is the difference between the mechanism of action? So in PRP, we use a little uh, heavier burn. It's usually grade three, grade three in terms of intensity. It's a 200, minimum 200 micron spot size, although in the DRS study, they have used 500 micron spot size, which is rather too big and it caused a lot of uh, uh, peripheral field loss. But nowadays we use a 200 micron spot size, a grade three burn, and uh, the duration of the burn is about 0 0.8, to, that is 80 to 100 milliseconds. And the um, one that we use in macular edema is, is a 100 micron spot size. Although sometimes we do use 200 micron spot size as well. 100 micron spot size is the recommended one with a grade two burn. In, in the, at the macula, we are more gentle. We don't use a grade three burn. We use a grade two burn, exactly the one which we use in CSE as well. So any macular problem, we use grade two. But the problem with macular diseases is that sometimes we end up giving a heavier reaction because of the, thick, the sheer thickness of the retina. In the macular edema, the, the, the retina is thickened. It is edematous. The thickness of the retina is more than 200 or 300 or sometimes 400 microns. And on that, if you have to get a visible reaction, we end up creating sometimes a grade 3 burn. So that's okay. That we have to aim at grade 2 burn. The power of the burn, the duration of the burn is about 0 0.05 or 50 milliseconds. And the power is between 200 to 300, depending on what desired reaction you want, what, what intensity of uh, burn you want. So that's the difference between, and the spacing is the same. The spacing is one burn width apart, whether it is PRP or whether it is grid laser at the macula, the spacing is the same. So these are the four things that you have to look at. One is the grade in, uh, intensity of the burn or the grade of the burn, the spot size, the duration and the spacing. spacing. So, yeah. So, what would be the difference between uh, barrier laser and barrage laser? Well, barrier laser is something that we use as a barrier to cut off the subretinal fluid from spreading. For example, I showed you the tear. The tear that I showed you, which was which had a cuff of subretinal fluid, is uh, covered all around by barrage laser or a peripheral detachment. You won't don't want it to uh, progress posteriorly and involve the macula something that you want to do as an emergency treatment because the patient is unable to undergo surgery immediately. So you do a barrier laser, cut off that area from the rest of the uh, attached retina by a barrier. So that is simple. So you do laser all around up to the ora serrata, all along the border of the detachment and prevent it from progressing backwards or posteriorly. That is barrier laser. On the contrary, barrage laser is a term used for uh, encircling the lesion, meaning a hole, a tear without a subretinal fluid or a lattice degeneration, you do a barrage. Barrage uh, basically means a bridge, uh, sorry, a, a dam. The meaning of barrage, if you know in, in, in irrigation language, in the language of irrigation, you ask a civil engineer, he will tell you what a barrage is. He say, if you ask him, he'll say it's a dam. So, so barrage means a dam. A dam is built all around the lattice degeneration all, all around the hole or a tear, which will prevent uh, the any leakage of vitreous fluid that, that can possibly go into the hole and cause lifting off of the lattice degeneration and the surrounding retina by anchoring it all around by the laser. So that's the barrage laser in contrast to barrier laser. They're just two different terminologies, both serving the same purpose, 
but barrier laser is something to prevent progression barrage laser is something to prevent detachment in the first place yeah. right so right. and so what were the indications for the posterior hyalotomy and how do we do it so posterior hyalotomy is uh, is uh, is something that we usually wait and watch we unless it's a sub ilm hemorrhage if you can nowadays we we have the facility of uh, the oct by which we can actually see the level of the hemorrhage we can know whether it is sub hyaloid or sub ilm and based on that we can take a call on whether uh, we can we can guess whether the the hemorrhage is going to resolve or whether it's going to take time uh, to resolve so based on that we take a call on treatment with yag hyaloidotomy before uh, resorting to surgery so yag hyaloidotomy is something that we do if the ilm sub ilm hemorrhage is elevated far away from the retina because your laser spot should not damage the retina it, there is a possible chance of the laser spot if it is not well controlled or if it is not well titrated um to cause damage to the uh, to cause disruption of the hyaloid as well as of the retina therefore you have to be very careful and the parameters are we use a uh, 2 or 3 mill, uh, millijoule power 2 or 3 millijoule power with an offset there is something called an offset in yag laser an offset meaning we aim at a particular point but the actual laser would take its effect either in front or behind by the number of microns that you have set the offset at so if you set the offset at p 125 that means the actual laser will happen 125 microns behind your focus point or if it is a 125 it will happen 125 microns anterior to the focus point so what we do is we take an a 125 and use a 2 to 3 millijoules of power and hit the hyaloid with a sharp focus of the slit lamp contact lens so with that it is sometimes the hyaloid opens very well and you can actually see the blood dramatically flowing out if you you have to wait for it because it doesn't uh, there is a formed vitreous in front of it so there is no uh, there is resistance to its flow so it takes time for the blood to flow out and uh, it's a matter of few minutes sometimes a few hours sometimes one day before the blood actually gets evacuated from the subhyaloid space or the subilem space and there is a clarity uh, or clearing of the uh, posterior pole and the patient gets immediate vision right so uh, so the question is that in hemi retinal vein occlusion with nve would you prefer to laser the entire retina or just the involved half so one thing we should understand about laser treatment is that it is the ischemic retina that is producing the vegf or the the uh, the in the growth factors it's not just vegf we know that there are other growth other factors it's not just vegf there are other growth factors as well which cause which drive the causation of uh, neovascularization so and from where is it produced it is produced from ischemic retina only so you have to treat only the hemi retina and not the rest of the retina uh, it's a misnomer to so just because there is an nvd you should see the cause for the nvd you should you should find out the cause for the nvd you should just because it's a disc neovascularization doesn't mean that you have to do a complete prp you have to find out the ischemic area it may be simple brvo it may be one sector that is that is ischemic it may be hemi retinal it may be uh, hemi retinal because of a crvo hemi crvo or it could be uh, it could be um, a central vein occlusion instead of a hemi central or branch vein it could even be a central retinal vein occlusion in which case you will do a prp complete retinal treatment but definitely not complete treatment if it is a hemi retinal vein occlusion or if it is a branch retinal vein occlusion you will treat only the sector that is ischemic right. okay so right. so there's one last question and the question is that uh, in say for example ocular ocular tumors like retinoblastoma so we start focal treatment by the third cycle of chemotherapy if at baseline we see that there is srf deposition at the macula should be treated or we should leave it for settling down well i think uh, if there is if there is uh, subretinal fluid on the tumor whether it is and the macula away from the tumor then i think you can still treat you can still treat 
if it is a small tumor if you are if you are talking about laser treatment or a ttt for a small tumor which is less than 3 mm or so 3 mm or less in size you can treat the treatment the uh, tumor even if it is associated with subretinal fluid elsewhere if that answers your question yeah and do we do we focal like, do we treat the srf particularly or we don't or we should leave it aside no the cause for the srf is a tumor right the cause that for the srf so you have to the... treat the root cause if you are treating yeah. the root cause the, the tumor will shrink and the srf will automatically subside secondarily okay and the possibility of exudative response uh, getting deposited at the macula is that Uh, uh, See, it is a concern, but then what we have to look at is the patient's uh, uh, sight and the life both. Right. So we, we are very worried about tumor uh, metastasis and all that. So first thing is life, second is sight. Right. So if if it is a question of uh, SRF causing um, lipid deposition or whatever deposition at the fovea, which may turn out to be permanent later, we are not worried as much as. Worried about the life of the patient. Definitely. Right. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all our questions and uh, taking your time out, sir. It was indeed a class that uh, is extremely important, and uh, uh, I think it's available online for postgraduates, so it's cherished forever. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you, Rolika. It was my my pleasure entirely. I enjoyed uh, speaking to the postgraduates in this particular forum. thank you for inviting me enjoyed having you here sir thank you to all the post graduates the next class will be on the april 29th that is going to be in on endophthalmitis diagnosis and management by dr tara prasad das sir great, great. we'll all see you there thank you so much sir thank, thank good you. night bye good night